So if you will, stand with me as we do each week. Let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7, and we'll go to 13 to get the fuller context and then dive in. Paul writes, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he, meaning Christ, gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That is God's word to us. You may be seated, and let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, as we turn our attention to studying what your word says about spiritual gifts, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be active in our hearts and our minds, that our our minds would be renewed, that we would think the way you want us to think, that our eyes would be open to the truth you want us to see, that our ears would be open to what you would have us hear. Uh, Prepare our hearts through, as we already have sung your word, and now we study your word, and then afterwards to take communion and remember Jesus, your sacrifice on the cross. Uh, May we leave today more encouraged, more edified, more aware of your glory, and more aware of our desperate need of you and the grace it is to be called your children. Thank you, Father, for loving us, for adopting us. Help me to be a faithful preacher and teacher of your word here and now. Do what only you can do and move in power through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Shortly before his death in 1840, there was a great violinist. His name was Niccolo Paganini, very famous for the way that he played the violin. He willed his particular violin to his hometown of Genoa. But before he did that, he had one condition that if he would donate or will this violin to his hometown, that it would never be used, that it would be stored away, never to be ruined or even played or enjoyed again, so that he would be the last one to have enjoyed it. Now, that's an unfortunate condition because violin woods like spruce and willow and rosewood show very little decline if they continue to be used. So the whole goal of such a fabulous violin would be it would continue to be used. Well, he wanted it stored. When that happens, those type of woods and instruments begin to immediately decay. And so hidden away in its case, this fabulous violin, a tool of beautiful music, turned into a rotting relic. That is never what should happen to such a beautiful and useful instrument. Now, until it was restored, uh, it was deteriorating and sitting there as a reminder that gifts and talents and extraordinary gifts and talents are meant to be used. They are not treasures to be stored away. Likewise, our spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to us, that Christ bestows upon us, are not things to be stored away or or just sat upon in idleness, but they are to be used, never wasted. And in order to help us understand the, the whole purpose and the definition of spiritual gifts, I want us to turn our attention to verses 7 and 8, beginning with the first point, that Christ gives everyone a spiritual gift. Christ gives everyone a spiritual gift. Paul writes, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Notice the phrase, each one. God has given each of you a spiritual 
gift. And we know that the context here is spiritual gifts, and that's what Paul means by grace given because of the greater overall context of this section and then we'll draw some parallels from uh, 1 Corinthians 12 as well as Romans 12. But the idea here is that God has poured out the blessing of salvation. That's a gift. And he has also poured out the spiritual blessing of gifts, special abilities that he has given for you to be purposed and useful in his body. And so you think about this for a second and, and the grace that it It is that he would save us. And then the grace upon grace that he would unify us, which is another part of this whole section and the theme of unity and we're being one body. And then that he would use us in the midst of all that and give us beautiful gifts to work together as his body is grace upon grace upon grace. And while unity is the theme in this section, uniformity is not, and here's what I mean and what I want you to notice, is in that phrase, each one, we see diversity. That we as a body are gifted differently so that we can function together. Not everybody is given the same spiritual gift. Not everybody has the same wiring, if you will. That's a beautiful picture of the way God designs the church. And how does he distribute his gifts. We see that in the phrase, according to the measure of Christ's gift. What he means by that is Jesus decides how much of any given gift or blend of gifts you and I receive. Similar to Romans 12, 3, where Paul says, to each one God measured out the measure of faith. In the Greek grammar here, it's in the genitive, which denotes possession. And why is that significant? Well, when you and I get jealous or envious or frustrated when other people are gifted differently or things aren't the way we think they should be, think about this for a moment. The measure of gifts given and the way they're given, they come from Christ. So there's no reason for jealousy. There's no reason for a possessive envy as though they're ours or, or even any reason to believe that you have to do more of anything to get more of something Christ possesses the gifts. They belong to him. That's what that term of represents, the measure of Christ's gift. You picture him like a master builder, and he has all of the supplies, and he divvies out what you and I need and how much we need so that he would build us up. I think about this in terms of uh, of a chef measuring out the different ingredients according to what is needed. Not too much of that, but not too little of that in order to create the perfect meal. That is what Christ is doing. He owns the gift, and he determines and he decides the measure given. And this is how healthy bodies function as well. We know this biologically, that for us, picture... Uh, the different muscle groups that require more blood flow, like the legs, the quads, if you've ever exercised. You could go jog for 15 minutes, and that will wear you out a little bit. But if you were to to do squats, you would be depleting your body in astronomically larger ways and more exhausting ways than just going on a 15-minute jog. Why? Well, because the quads and your glutes and your trunk, the core, are a larger muscle group, and you are depleting that muscle group. Well, so it is with the body. God knows, and He's wired us to be divvied out various measures so that we would function. Uh, A a finger doesn't need as much blood flow or oxygen-rich blood as the quads do in the middle of exercise. This is why even when we're freezing or in extreme conditions, certain extremities aren't going to need as much blood flow. This is why the brain requires a certain amount of blood flow, why it might shut down when feeling threatened or not getting enough oxygen-rich blood. The body works this way physically, so it does spiritually. Jesus is measuring out the gifts. And all of this is so that the body would thrive. Jealousy regarding the gifts, competition regarding the gifts, and the lack of using your gifts is just not biblical at all. Honer says it this way regarding using our gifts. The different measures of gifts don't determine the value of the person. What he means by that is 
You know, if you have a speaking gift and you're more, more heard than everyone else, that doesn't mean you're more valuable than the person who is in the background. But listen to what he says about value. The difference of value is determined only by the individual's use of it within the body. So picture this. Christ is measuring out gifts. And maybe you've been gifted in tremendous ways, but you don't use your gift. And somebody else is is gifted with a similar style of gifting in less than you've been given, but is willing to serve and use their gift. They are bringing value to the body of Christ, though they have been given less talents, if you will, than you. Meanwhile, the person who is exceptionally gifted is bringing no value to the body of Christ. In fact, they're going to be called an unfaithful servant one day when they meet Christ because they've been gifted tremendously but are not bringing value to the body. We are all valuable from a salvation standpoint. God loves us all. He has saved and redeemed all of us. Those of you that are believers, you can rest assured in that. There's no you know, social credit system, if you will, spiritually speaking. However, the value that a gift brings is determined by whether or not you will use it. Every single gift matters. Every single gift is needed. Why? Well, because Christ, the owner of the gifts, has measured out the gifts. Therefore, as his people, we should be using our gifts. This is why uh, we have a team culture at Shepherd's House. And our team culture is based on three things. Are you humble, are you teachable, and are you available? Of course, you need to be a believer, and we would assume that the people coming into membership are going through a process, and we do have one here to ensure that the people who are a part of our church and who are members here are believers and are baptized and are walking with the Lord and served. And in all of that, we would ask people, not that they're superstars, not that everybody is the best at everything, but that are you humble, or are you teachable, are you available, are you willing to jump in and serve. Why? Because God isn't looking for superstars. He's looking for faithful servants, willing to serve with whatever measure he has given them. That is the idea here. When Paul introduces the topic that Christ has given everyone a spiritual gift and he wants to see the body built up in health. Now, 1 Corinthians 12 is a fantastic parallel passage for us to understand. So we're going to spend some significant time there and then move back over to Ephesians 4. And so turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want to answer a couple of questions. First, what is a spiritual gift? And second, what is the purpose of spiritual gifts? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to give you a working definition here off the top. What is a spiritual gift? The basic definition, I'll give it to you first and then explain where I get it from in 1 Corinthians 12, is spiritual gifts are undeserved special abilities that are given to all believers from the Holy Spirit for the purpose of building up the church. Christ has measured them out. The Holy Spirit applies them to our lives and works through us. Spiritual gifts are undeserved special abilities that are given to all believers from the Holy Spirit for the purpose of building up the church. Where did I get that from? Well, if you look at 1 Corinthians 12 and you first look at verse 4, we see there are different gifts but the same Spirit. So that means the source of spiritual gifts is the same Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. And we know that they're undeserved. You didn't do anything to earn them because... Paul uses this word for gifts, the Greek word charisma, which literally translates grace gift. The word grace, the Greek word charis, is undeserved or unmerited favor. God has poured out unmerited, undeserved favor upon you through this gift from the Holy Spirit. We know that's true with the gift of salvation, and so it is with spiritual gifts. They are from God. You did nothing to earn them. You simply need to operate in them. And they are connected to the Holy Spirit in every way, shape, and form, not disconnected from the Holy Spirit. He is the source. He is who Christ uses to apply them to our lives. And we know that everybody has been given one because in verse 7, Paul says to each one, same idea in Ephesians 4, each one is given 
the manifestation of the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, for the common good. So every one of you have been given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. What's the word manifestation mean? It means to be put on display, to be brought about. So the Holy Spirit is, if you will, putting Himself or His work in you on display through your life. And how does He do that? Through your spiritual gift. And so that's where I get the definition that a spiritual gift is an undeserved special ability given to all believers from the Holy Spirit for the purpose of building up the church. I want to expand on the purpose more. So what is the purpose of spiritual gifts? You've seen it a little bit in the text. For the common good, for building up the body of Christ. But I want to read this section together and then give you an expanded definition of the purpose. So if you will read together with me there in verses 1 to 7 of 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. This is an important statement. We'll unpack it shortly. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, so he shifts, there are varieties of gifts but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, meaning they cause different things. But the same God who works all things in all persons, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So from that particular passage in 1 Corinthians 12 on spiritual gifts, we can gather at least four key truths about the purpose of spiritual gifts. I want to walk you through each one of these. The first is they're used by God to lead the church into truth. They're used by God to lead the church into truth truth. They should never lead people into error. Where do I get that from? Well, from what Paul starts with. He starts off by reminding the Corinthians that they used to be pagans. He's reminding them of their old spiritual experiences. See, many people have spiritual experiences, but not all those experiences are rooted in the Holy Spirit. There could be evil spirits or deceitful spirits. This is why in 1 John, John says to test the spirits to see if they are from God. Paul begins there because the Corinthians were a little wild. They were a little off with their use of the gifts. There were abuses. So he starts in the middle of this entire letter, which is a letter of correction, reminding them, I don't want you to be uninformed or unaware. I don't want you going off into your old ways or your old belief systems. I don't want an interweaving of your old belief systems. We see this today when various people will, will intermingle with maybe new age beliefs mixed in with various biblical beliefs, and it can be confusing for people. Spiritual gifts, the purpose of them is to lead people into the truth, the church into the truth. He's encouraging the Corinthians to use discernment regarding their spiritual experiences. Any experience that takes you into uh, charted, uncharted territory or charted territory that doesn't match the Scriptures should be rejected. The Corinthians needed to be wise in understanding of what God's Word has to say. And in this case, through Paul's direct revelation from God to them. They had issues with sexual sin and immorality. They had issues uh, with their view of the Spirit's work. He reminded them they're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And they were, again, notorious for their misuse of spiritual gifts, and so he corrects them. That's why chapters 12, 13, and 14 are this beautiful section. No other church in the New Testament and no other letter gives this much attention to correction when it comes to spiritual gifts because the Corinthians were off the reservation, to put it lightly. And so it's important with that in mind to then also expand our definition of purpose. They aren't just for leading the church into truth and not into confusion, but they give everyone in the body of Christ a special part to play. Everybody has a special part to play. We get that from verses 4 and 5 and verse 7 of this section in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says there are varieties of gifts, varieties of ministries, and to each one is given. So 
We all have a part to play. God spreads out his gifts. He doesn't just save lost sinners and then say, okay, there's a special group. You're going to all sit over there and watch. And then there's, there's an anointed group, a really gifted group, and they're going to kind of put on the show. They're the ones to watch. He gives us all a variety of gifts and ministries. You could say it this way, that the purpose of spiritual gifts is to gift every believer with a purpose. There are no spectators in the body of Christ. We are all participators. Every part is meant to be used by God. And this is important because I remember an older pastor once, as I was trying to encourage people to serve in a, in a church setting and I was talking to him a little bit about what I was imagining a church would be and preparing for the church plant as well. And he said, you know, don't get too attached to the idea that a lot of people will serve and that a lot of people will give and a lot of people will use their gifts. There's this thing called the 80-20 rule. I said, what's the 80-20 rule? He said, well, in the church, this is how it goes and you might as well just accept it. It's the way it is. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. 20% of the people give 80% of the money. And 20% of the people cause 80% of the problems. And those same 20% take up 80% of your time. Just accept that now. You'll be saving yourself a great deal of frustration. I refuse to accept it. Though I understand it. I get it. Why? Because in the American church, we're taught, maybe not by teaching, but by acting it out, where it's caught, not taught, that there's a group of professionals, and I'm one of them. And you all come, and you watch the professionals serve, and, and you do a few things to help out, but most of all, just come and watch the professionals and we're the gifted, anointed ones, and you're sort of all on the train along for the ride, and we'll get you to heaven. And on the way there, give your money, show up a few times, and, and we'll get there. That's not how the body of Christ works, friends. We have all been given a unique, special part to play. It's not the professionals and the amateurs. It's not the anointed and then the, the spectator group that watches and oohs and awes over them and would only wish that they could be that important and that special and that useful to God. But it's good enough that I just sit and cheer that on. I just want to be a really good cheerleader for what God's doing. No, you are supposed to be and I am supposed to be a participant in what God is doing. We get the 80-20 rule through the American church model not through the biblical church model. Everyone's been given a gift. Third, their purpose is to foster unity in the Spirit. No matter what our giftedness is, we all receive the gifts from the same Spirit. We have the same Lord, verse 5. We have the same God who's working all things in us, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 6. And evidently there were those in Corinth who were being spiritually arrogant. They were boasting in their gifts as though they didn't need other people and maybe even looking down on people who had different gifts or seemingly lesser but not truly lesser gifts than they did. And so Paul reminds them in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 12, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Plain and simple, church, we need each other. Every gift needs other gifts. Spiritual gifts foster unity. There's a togetherness in serving. And that's a major part of their purpose. Important question to ask is if spiritual gifts are dividing the body, then are we understanding them properly? Are we using them properly? Oftentimes you'll, you'll see this play out. Uh, just in their use, somebody being obedient, being faithful, using their gift is serving, and somebody else who's very gifted is invited in to serve and to be a part, and the person who is gifted and being obedient is encouraging the person who is gifted and disobedient, and it's sometimes uh, a bit of a fire starter if the person has the gift of exhortation, who's exhorting the other person, because then it's strong truth, and they may tell someone, you need to be serving, you need to be giving. You need to be active in the body. And this person says, oh, leave me alone, you legalist, you overachiever, you churchaholic. I, I, you know, enough with all that. And this person says, no, you need to be serving. The Bible says, and then all of a sudden you have a rift 
Why? Why isn't there going to be unity there? Well, because we've both been given gifts from the same spirit, the same Lord. We're part of the same body. One part doesn't want to function. One part does. That part calls the other part to function. It still doesn't want to function. We're going to have problems. The body is supposed to be operating together in its different, unique, special purposes. Number four, they're for the common good. Everybody should be benefiting at some level. In verse 7 of chapter 12, there in 1 Corinthians, spiritual gifts are for the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The Spirit works through the gifts to bring the body together. That phrase, common good, it literally translates to bring together. So spiritual gifts properly used and faithfully used are going to bring us together. A church will feel more cohesive, more unified. Even if you don't know everybody intensely and deeply and personally all the time, and as the church grows with new converts and people joining and they're a part of the body, you still know you're running the same direction. They're for the common good. And finally, they're only given to believers. They're only given to believers. Nowhere in Scripture, including the letter of 1 Corinthians, are, are unbelievers addressed with regard to spiritual gifts. So your ability to run fast is not a spiritual gift. An atheist and a pastor, not me, can run fast. Uh, your ability to, to shoot Steph Curry three-pointers or throw 102 miles an hour from a pitcher's mound is not a spiritual gift. That is a talent. That's an ability. Believers and unbelievers alike can do that. A spiritual gift is attached to what happens in the body of Christ. we we'll go even further. Playing an instrument is not a spiritual gift. Many unbelievers can do the same thing that believers do with an instrument. However, the willingness to use that ability or talent for the body of Christ may be attached to the spiritual gift of service. Or some of you are exceptionally gifted in, in other ways, matched with incredible talents, and you bring those things together. The spiritual gift, though, is the desire to serve the body, or to exhort, or teach, or lead, or gifts of hospitality. All of those things are important to understand. There needs to be distinctions between what is a talent and an ability versus a spiritual gift. They're only given to believers because they're purposed for the church. So if we take that list to heart, it's pretty obvious gifts are for glory, but not our own. They're for the glory of God. They're for the common good, not just the good of an individual. They reflect Jesus' model and the attitude that Paul lays out in Philippians chapter 2, where even though he was fully God, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself. He became a bondservant. This is the John the Baptist mentality, the idea that he has a great ministry to fulfill, but he says, I'm not the Christ, but I'll point you to the Christ. He was there to carry a, a towel, if you will, not necessarily chase after a title. He was a foot washer like Jesus. This is the way we should be viewing spiritual gifts. No one can operate alone. We need each other. No one man, no woman is self-made in the church. No ministry is self-made in the church. This is why team building is so key as well to fruitful ministry. This is why our church body here is a team building mentality. Everybody needs other People, we come together in spiritual unity. We're thankful to God for gifts given in diversity, and then this grows up into spiritual maturity. It is never about one person. It is always about one body and one Lord working in our midst through one Spirit, the Holy Spirit. That's how this works. And so not only does Christ give everyone a spiritual gift, Next, I want you to understand that Christ displays his power through spiritual gifts. I like to say it this way. Jesus likes to show off through the church. He wants the glory. God is a glory hog. He won't share his glory with another. He's all about his own glory because he knows he's the best thing going for all of humanity. And so what Jesus does is put on display his mighty sovereign power through the gifts. If you will turn back to Ephesians chapter 4, we'll pick it up 
in verses 9 and 10, and I'll show you this from the text. Paul says, back in verse 8, leading into 9 and 10, Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Whenever uh, an author in Scripture interjects into this section with with that, and maybe you have the NASB or another version where this is all capital letters, what he's doing is taking from the Old Testament a psalm or a prophecy, and he's illustrating for you, a real important point. Now this expression, he says, he ascended. What does it mean except that he, meaning Christ, also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. Why does Paul bring this into the text? Well, he's summarizing Psalm 68. That's where this is from. And that particular psalm is a victory song about how Christ, God, has triumphed over His enemies. And the psalm points to the power of God, the glory of God, and the majesty of God. Paul brings it in as an illustration in this particular instance because he is showing you and I, and first, of course, the audience there in the Ephesian church, the giver of the gifts is always to be praised far above the one gifted. The reason we have the gifts is because Christ was victorious first. The reason that you and I may do anything quote-unquote great at all is because of the greatness of our Savior who first conquered darkness, saved us, then gifted us. In other words, all glory, power, dominion, the gifts, all honor, credit, and worship always goes to Jesus alone. That's Paul's point. Jesus is a conquering king, and he has sovereign right over the gifts. This is again why no one can sell the gifts. You can't impart the gifts. I can't tell you come to this service and you're going to get the gifts. Men have to get out of the way of that process. Only the Holy Spirit gives the gifts. We might be able to teach about the gifts. We might be able to help you understand what your gift is based on the way you serve. But in the end, No one can give you the gifts, impart the gifts, do much else with the gifts. The Holy Spirit is the one who applies what Christ has measured to your life. He is the sovereign giver of the gifts. And this is why that's so important is because there will be moments where you'll hear people say that, if you do this, you'll get the gifts, or if, if you just come to this service, or if you do this or that, that you'll get this or that gift. It's all a sovereign work of the Spirit of God, and when He pours out His gifts, brothers and sisters, you are going to know that you know that you know that you are gifted, because the gifts of God are irrevocable, they are evident, they are powerful, they are clear, and you will operate in it beautifully and supernaturally, because they come from God. And, and what if we approach the gifts this way then? Every definition of greatness would point back to Christ, not man. at a conference in 2021 last year. Paul Washer put it this way. I wrote it down. I'll never forget the moment. I was very convicted. He said, there's no such thing as a great man of God. Only weak, pitiful, faithless men of a great and merciful God. What was his whole point to a, a, a conference filled with ministers who at times can overestimate our importance in the body? That there are no men of God in their own right. No great men. No super anointed ones. There are only those who can say, I am weak, pitiful, sinful, finite, flesh. Like Paul says, who is adequate for these things? And a great, merciful, mighty God has chosen to enlist me in his service. 
wow, we're really not that impressive, but God is. Wow, we're really not that extra special, but God is. Wow, we're really not that powerful, but God is. The glory, the credit, the honor, the dominion, the worship, and the majesty, all go to the one who rightfully deserves such honor and praise. He is God. I want to bring us down the home stretch with a few principles now from the church at Corinth so that we have the right foundation for spiritual gifts, the right perspective, so that as we build atop this in future weeks, we don't have to go back and redefine and relay the foundation because the original foundation was faulty. Oftentimes we learn about spiritual gifts from varying views. We maybe have experiences. And in our case here at our church, I want us to have a biblical foundation so that everything else points back to the Word of God. First, nothing you have is yours. Nothing you have is yours. Nothing I have is mine. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, to the exceptionally gifted and the spiritual, spiritually arrogant Corinthians, Paul says this, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Church, nothing we have is ours. Everything we have belongs to God. And like all human beings, the, the church at Corinth, they struggled with spiritual pride. They had all sorts of supernatural gifts, including healing, tongues, interpretation of tongues. They were prophetic. And Paul's reminder to them, which is really a reprimand, is a helpful reminder to us. We cannot ever take credit for our spiritual gift. We do not earn our spiritual gift. Nothing we have is ours. All our gifts are for the glory of God and the good of the church. So that impacts even when we aren't using our spiritual gift. We are holding back that which does not belong to us. It should be used for the body. Number two, very important principle, the Spirit gives the gifts as He wills. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, Paul gives a beautiful explanation that every believer is given a different gift and that all of these work of one and the same Spirit and that He distributes to each one as He determines. That is clear in the text. The sovereign Spirit of God gives the gifts as He wills. And I know envy will be a constant temptation. It might be. We might say, well, why am I not gifted like him? Or you may say, well, why? I wish I was gifted like her. These are not thoughts from the Spirit of God. One of the fastest ways to breed division in the body is to foster a competitive spirit and a spirit of envy with spiritual gifts instead of celebrating and cheering on the different ministries so that one mission, one body, one focus, one vision, if you will, from God through His Word is what is being accomplished. And no one person is beginning to feel like or make it about them. Where jealousy and selfish ambition are, you'll find every evil work, James 3.16 says, and so it's important for us to know the Spirit gives the gifts as He wills. We want to celebrate as God uses different people according to God's sovereign plan. And third, finally, God arranges the body of Christ as He wants. In the same vein as the Spirit giving the gifts as He wills, He arranges the body as He wants. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18, and then verse 28, Paul explicitly says it this way, but in fact God has placed the parts in the body every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. And this means that in different churches, you'll have, I mean, local churches, part of the big C, body of Christ, you'll have people operating in different 
ways. We're not like, you know, franchises, if you will, or, or different businesses, you know, competing against each other. We're, we're one body, and God, as He wants, puts the parts in different places in order to accomplish His goal and His mission. And so we don't even need to worry about competing with other churches. It's not about ours or theirs. He decreed diversity. He wants the body to have different parts functioning in different ways, like the human body. We as the body function in the most healthy way when we embrace our own unique gifting and celebrate the unique gifting of others. Those are the principles that we should operate by and how we should view spiritual gifts. Next time, we'll begin walking through a biblical description of the gifts in two messages, and my prayer is that as you see those properly defined, it'll help you be able to discern and understand how God has given us the gifts.